This is part D in the practical transfusion medicine series for the internal medicine residents rotating through their hematology ward and consult rotations at the University of Alberta Hospital in Edmonton, Alberta. This is Dr. Wong speaking. So uh, we're now going to move into a small discussion on the etiology of febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reactions, which if the uh, reaction is associated with the fever and uh, and it is related to the transfusion, uh, FMHTR is the most common uh, etiology for the fever associated with the reaction. So typically the etiology is uh, due to patient having uh, already antibodies uh, formed, direct, uh, formed against a residual donor white cells in whatever unit you are uh, giving to the patient. So once uh, the whole blood uh, is donated or if rhesus platelets or etc is donated at CBS uh, before the product arrives at the individual hospital blood banks to be uh, put on to their shelves for inventory um, every product undergoes a pre-storage leukocyte reduction procedure in which the uh, liquid is run through a uh, white cell uh, filter this get, gets rid of a lot of the residual uh, donor white cells but can never get rid of all of it and because of that reason, there are always some residual uh, donor white cells left remaining in the product regardless of what you're dealing with. So some patients have formed uh, anti-HLA antibodies. So for a febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction, the most common etiology is your patient has already uh, formed HLA antibodies against uh, foreign HLA antigens that are present on the residual donor white cells in the product. So that's one etiology. The second etiology is that the residual donor white cells in the product during their uh, shelf life will release cytokines and these cytokines once transfused to the patient will elicit a febrile response. We already talked about bacterial sepsis a little bit but just to review bacterial sepsis should be suspected if the patient has a severe febrile response, usually the temperature going above 39 degrees Celsius. This may be associated with severe chills and riders, plus minus hypotension, renal failure, and disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. Bacterial sepsis is more common with platelet transfusions due to the room temperature storage, but with RBCs, uh, they are more severe because the culprit organisms are gram-negative organisms. On to case three. This is a 37-year-old woman who was previously healthy, uh, unfortunately was involved in a head-on collision in a motor vehicle accident. She was hypotensive on scene once arrived uh, at the ER. She had a CT abdomen done and that showed an active uh, liver bleed. She received two units of uncrossed matched red cells in the eMERGE uh, with an improvement in her blood pressure and a more stable heart rate. Then she was moved to the OR for emergency laparotomy surgery in which uh, various interventions were performed and in the OR she received six more red cells and four of plasma. This was her pre-transfusion chest x-ray, not the best inspiratory view but the x-ray was clear. Postoperatively uh, she was admitted to the ICU and then extubu uh, extubated. Her hematologic parameters were as follows, hemoglobin of 116 mildly reduced, platelets were mildly reduced at 95, she was not bleeding, her white cell count uh, was all right, and her INR was only minimally elevated at 1.3, but again, she was not bleeding. Post-op day one, planned to discharge to the surgical ward for observation in the step-down unit. Uh, that afternoon, her platelet count was 68. She was not bleeding, but for some reason, she received one full platelet that afternoon. Two hours after the platelet transfusion, she developed a dry cough, and by midnight that night, she was intubated for hypoxia. Post-transfusion, her chest x-ray uh, was like this. There were new bilateral lung infiltrates. So this is discussion uh, regarding shortness of breath during or post-transfusion. So I mentioned before, TACO stands for transfusion-related circulatory overload, and that is the most common cause of shortness of breath developing during or post-transfusion, and it is typically associated with hypertension. TRALI stands for transfusion-related acute lung injury, and it, it has the highest mortality out of this list of causes. In addition, shortness of breath during a post-transfusion may be part of a serious generalized allergic reaction, even anaphylaxis, can even be a part of bacterial sepsis, and again, acute hemolytic transfusion reaction may be a possibility. 
what is the definition of trolley. So the new acute lung injury has to be acute and onset and has to be new. And more importantly, the ALI has to occur during or within six hours of the completion of a transfusion. So the definition of ALI is that there has to be new onset acute hypoxemia measured either by O2 saturation dropping below 90% on room air, or if uh, ABG was done, the PaO2 to FiO2 ratio is less than 300 millimeters of mercury, and or there's other clinical evidence, for example, cyanosis. Bilateral lung infiltrates are often seen uh, as a new finding on the chest X-ray, and there should not be any evidence of circulatory overload. Important in this uh, definition is that there shouldn't be any other risk factors of acute lung injury, which if you review the list below, many inpatients are admitted for one or both or some other reason and may have some confounding factors present. So in real time, um, to call uh, shortage of breath reaction related def definitively to trolley is usually extremely difficult and additional testing needs to be done to confirm this. Trolley is an immune-mediated um, transfusion reaction, and because uh, the antibodies responsible are present in the plasma, any plasma-containing blood product, including whole blood, red cells, platelets, plasma, and crown precipitate, may uh, has or has been implicated in trolley. In my clinical experience, I have seen one case of IVIG-related uh, trolley, and it has not uh, yet been reported for albumin or RH immune globulin. The etiology um, is an antibody-mediated event, so most commonly the scenario is that the uh, donor or the product itself has uh, HLA or granulocyte antibodies, and once these antibodies are infused into the patient, they react against the patient's leukocytes, uh, which lead to the extravasation of the neutrophils in the patient uh, onto the uh, capillary walls in the pulmonary vasculature, leading to a leaky capillary type syndrome and the uh, bilateral chest infiltrates that you see associated with trolley. The opposite side of the coin does also occur. And it tends to happen in uh, patients already susceptible um, to trolley. So because it is an immune uh, mediated event related to the presence of HLA antibodies and or human granulocyte antibodies, uh, trolley testing involves getting the patient uh, samples and any implicated donor uh, to come in for HLA typing as well as HLA and granulocyte antibody screening. The, these tests uh, are not done locally and uh, testing results require weeks to come back. So you would imagine the case that we were talking about, uh, the patient reacted and became short of breath and, and was intubated uh, when she was uh, transfused a one uh, pulled platelet. And remember way back in part A where we were talking about how we derived that unit of pulled platelet, it's uh, four people's platelets pulled into one bag. So if a pulled platelet is implicated in trolley, already four implicated donors must be uh, called in for testing. And any of those uh, donors, uh, other products that were um, generated as part of their whole blood transfusion, for example, red cells, plasma, etc., they are pulled off the shelf uh, at CVS or at the hospitals where they are already there and they must be quarantined until testing is completed. And CVS uh, has the difficult job of notifying the implicated donors to come in for testing. So back to the patient. So HLA testing and um, HLA antibody testing was done on the donor as well as the implicated uh, patient. And the patient end up having HLA A25 antigen, and one of the four donors in that platelet pool did have an anti-HLA A25. So because the clinical symptoms all fit, the timing fits with the ALI um, occurring within that time frame, and the uh, immunologic testing uh, results are conclusive, this is indeed a trolley reaction. So what happens uh, for this one donor who uh, is now implicated uh, as confirmed to have something to do or with trolley. So that donor, unfortunately, is no longer eligible to donate plasma for the purposes of transfusion, but however, their plasma can still be forwarded to the United States where they are fractionated to make IVIG and the other fractionated products. So the other hint that you're dealing actually with trolley and not something else 
is that trolley should resolve spontaneously with adequate oxygenation support in 24 to 48 hours. So if this patient had remained intubated and uh, ill from the respiratory standpoint beyond the 24 to 48 hours, then it is most likely not trolley. In order to reduce the risk of trolley, CBS has uh, undertaken various strategies. So for example, male plasma is used for transfusion as much as possible. The male plasma is also used to pull four people's platelets together into that one bag to make the pooled platelet, if at all possible. Uh, female plasma uh, tends to be diverted for fractionation to make the fractionation uh, blood products. There's now centralized testing for trolley. And the donor who is implicated in trolley is permanently deferred. Um, and that donor's products are removed from the donor pool. So finally, case four. Here is a 76-year-old man who presents to the emergency with acute confusion and a decrease in LOC with a GCS of eight. On CT scanning, there is an acute large left-sided intracranial hemorrhage. Past medical history is significant for atrial fibrillation on warfarin. Uh, medication history, he was not on any other anticoagulants or uh, antiplatelet drugs. And labs, um, he had a normal CBC, and the INR came back at 4.0, which is of course elevated, and the PTT was normal at 38. So question, how would you reverse the warfarin anticoagulation in this patient? Would you give vitamin KPO, request four units of plasma, give vitamin K 10 milligrams IV, request prothrombin complex concentrate, or recombinant factor 7A. So before we talk about reversing warfarin anticoagulation, we kind of have to review the uh, coagulation cascade. So once there's vascular injury, um, tissue factor is exposed in the subendothelial layer, and the factor 7 flowing by in the blood vessel encounters tissue factor uh, beneath the vessels and it's then activated into factor 7a and the tissue factor fa factor 7a complex together activate factor 10 which then of course activates the rest of the common pathway to make thrombin and eventually your fibrin clot. As soon as um, a burst of thrombin and fibrin are actually made as a result of the activation of the extrinsic pathway, the extrinsic pathway is actually immediately shut off by a TFPI inhibitor, also abbreviated as the tissue factor pathway inhibitor. So which is why in vivo, you need also thrombin to feed back to activate factors 11, 8, and 5 as part of the intrinsic pathway to continue to make your thrombin and fibrin clot. Warfarin is an indirect factor inhibitor. Um, it actually inhibits the vitamin K dependent factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, as well as protein C and S. So vitamin K deficiency and warfarin anticoagulation primarily affect the extrinsic pathway because factor 7 actually has the shortest half-life out of all the factors. So because factor 7 has the shortest half-life out of the two 9 and 10 also inhibited by warfarin anticoagulation, the primary effect on the labs in terms of your coagulation testing is a prolongation of the PTINR. I would note that uh, oral vitamin K takes 18 to 24 hours uh, to reverse warfarin anticoagulation and IV vitamin K works a little faster but still takes about 6 to 12 hours for effect. So how does warfarin um, affect the vitamin K cycle and hence anticoagulate your patient? So your liver actually makes the precursors to factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. And in order for these precursor factors to participate in your coagulation cascade, they must be carboxylated. And in so doing, vitamin K is converted into vitamin K epoxide, which is its oxidized form. In order to reduce the vitamin K to keep uh, the carboxylation reaction going to make your actual 2, 7, 9, and 10 to participate in the coagulation cascade, vitamin K epoxide must be reduced, first by vitamin K epoxide reductase, and this is the enzyme that is warfarin sensitive. Then vitamin K quinone form is then further reduced by an enzyme uh, called vitamin K reductase. Vitamin K reductase